How and why would you selectively lighten or darken parts of your images? It's all about dodging and burning on today's episode of Ask David Bergman. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back. Here I am, as always, answering your photography questions right here on Adorama TV. If you've got a photo question, you know what to do. Just go to askdavidbergman.com and submit that form on the site. I just might pick your question and answer right here on a future show. Today's question was sent in by Joshua L. And he wants to know, I've heard about dodging and burning and have seen some Photoshop tutorials on it, but I don't really know when or why to do it to my images. Can you help? Thanks, Joshua, for sending that in. It's a good question, and I'll see if I can answer it for you. Now, the technique of dodging and burning a photograph has been around for a very long time, long before digital photography. What it means is to selectively brighten or darken parts of an image. Now, I started my photography career as a newspaper photographer. There was no digital yet, so we shot everything on film. We were mostly using negative film and had to print our work for publication in the paper. Now, to print from negatives in the darkroom, you put the film in an enlarger and you project the image down onto photosensitive paper for a period of time. And darkroom printing was an important part of the creative process because you could change the look of your photos when you printed them. The more light that hits the paper, the darker the image gets. So it was up to you to decide how long to have that light shining through the enlarger, kind of like figuring out your exposure when taking pictures. But you didn't have to just expose the whole paper at once. Dodging and burning are techniques to block parts of the projected light to over or underexpose portions of your image. You can use your hands, of course, but we'd also make little tools of various shapes to selectively block the light in the darkroom. For example, I had a big paper clip that I bent into a long straight line and I taped a small round piece of cardboard on the end of it. If I had an eight second exposure in the enlarger and I used that tool to block the light on part of my image for one second of those eight, then the part of the image that I was blocking would be a little bit lighter. Now that was called dodging. I think it might've been called that because you had to keep the tool moving because you didn't want to see the, a line where that paper clip was and also didn't want a hard circle where you had blocked the light with the cardboard. You had to feather it by moving it around. So you're always kind of dodging the light a bit to make parts of your image brighter. Now, if there's a part of your image that you wanted to make darker, then instead of blocking the light, you wanted to get more light on it. So maybe after that initial eight second exposure was over, you might turn the enlarger again back on with your hand blocking all the light from hitting the paper. And then you just move around a bit to let some light through to overexpose parts of your image. You could also you know, make shapes with your hand to let light through. We actually used to make large cardboard sheets with holes cut in them for a little bit more accuracy, but I usually just preferred to use my hands. Now this was called burning because you're kind of burning more light into the paper, which makes it darker. I'm not sure if those are the actual origins of the words, but it always made sense to me. Dodging to lighten and burning to darken. Now this is more art than science. Obviously you got better with experience, but you didn't know exactly what it was gonna look like until you ran the paper through the darkroom chemicals to see your final image. If you didn't like the way it looked, then you had to scrap that and start all over again. Now today, of course, almost everything is digital and we have incredible tools like Photoshop, Lightroom, and Capture One, and a bunch more others, of course. They all allow you to dodge and burn your images. Joshua, you said you know how to do it, and this is certainly not gonna be a full tutorial video, but the big picture here is that there are multiple ways to dodge and burn in the computer. Photoshop, for example, actually has dodge and burn tools built in. If you look closely, the dodge tool actually looks like a stick with a circle on the end of it, just like the paper clip and cardboard we used in the darkroom. And the burn tool looks like a hand making a hole where the light would go through. Whoever made those icons definitely knew what they were doing. Now there are other ways to selectively dodge and burn in Photoshop, mostly by using layers. I do all of my toning in Capture One when I do my raw conversions, and I'm gonna create lighten and darken layers that I can brush onto my image wherever I want. That gives me an incredible amount of control to selectively lighten and darken, and it's also non-destructive, so I can undo anything I want to get it looking just perfect. So now to get to the meat of Joshua's question, it's not just about knowing how to dodge and burn, it's knowing where and why. In my opinion, the overriding principle here is that you dodge and burn your images to control where you want the viewer to look in the frame. Our eyes naturally go to the brightest part of an image first. That's super important. So for me, if there's a person in my photo, I usually want their face to be just a little bit lighter. 
I don't wanna change someone's skin tone, of course, but I just wanna do what I can to draw your attention to them. Now, this is really all about your own creativity, and there's no right or wrong, and there's no rule that can't be broken. But here's an example of something that I would do. You probably know I'm Luke Combs' tour photographer, and here's a shot of him about to smash one of Jake Summers' symbols near the end of a show last year. Now, after I've cropped and toned the entire image how I want, your eye naturally goes to the center of the frame first because their arms are relatively bright. But Luke has a great expression where you can tell he's winding up with that drumstick to wail on Jake's kit. I want you to see that first because it's the most important part of this picture. So in Capture One, I'm gonna create a layer and I'm gonna call it Face. Now, whatever program you work in, by the way, I highly recommend naming your layers so you can tell what is what if you ever wanna go back and make changes. Anyway, I usually start by pushing the brightness way too high so I can really see what I'm working on. I'll use a big soft brush and just hit Luke's face with it one or two times. Then I'll dial down the brightness and might even lower the contrast a bit on this particular photo. There's a lot of shadow on Luke's face, like around his eyes, and I wanna lighten that without going too much brighter on the rest of his skin. So flattening it out a little helps me to do that. So that looks pretty good to me. I don't think I've lightened it too much and it still looks pretty natural, but I can take this one step further. Remember. Both guys' arms are pretty bright and the photo is really about Luke's facial expression more than anything else. So I'm gonna create another layer and call it arms. This time I'll darken that layer and use the same brush to go over the middle of the frame. I don't have to be super accurate here because I can always adjust it later, but I'll draw over the bright areas to darken them and then bring the brightness back up until it looks natural. I think I'll bring down the contrast on this one too because too much contrast is distracting. Then, if my brush was too big and I want to bring back some of the areas around their arms, I can switch from brush to erase and just erase some of that darkened layer. If I turn on the mask visibility, you can see the red area is where I brushed in the darkening. Now, I know I'm glossing over some of this, but again, this isn't meant to be a full software tutorial. I just want to show you why I'm doing what I'm doing. Now, I've dodged Luke's face and I've brushed their arms. If you step back and look at the picture with fresh eyes, you're much more inclined to see his facial expression. Compare that to when I turn off both layers and it's a huge difference. Here's the before and here's the after. So I always look at my subject's face and very often will brighten it a bit, but I also use burning to help guide your eyes as well. Here's a shot of Luke on stage at a stadium. I took this by using a remote camera I had set up on stage before the show. After cropping and general toning, it looks fine. Of course, there's no question that I want you to see Luke in front of 50,000 people, but look at all that light on the stage. All that brightness pulls your eye away. It's a distraction. So I'm gonna burn that down. Now again, I'll make a separate layer and I'm gonna call it stage. I'm gonna drop my brightness on the layer way down and brush in where I want. There are a few ways I can do it with this picture. I could brush the entire stage all the way across evenly and then bring it back up so it's more natural. That looks okay, but I prefer to darken my images in a way that guides your eye from dark to light. So let's undo that and use the linear gradient tool to create a mask that starts dark at the bottom and gets lighter as you move up the stage. That's better, but in this case, I think I also need to darken on the sides to really push your eyes back to the middle of the frame. I could manually brush it in, but I think I'm gonna use the radial gradient mask to have a more circular pattern. Once I have that positioned how I want, I'll go ahead and erase any part of the mask that's at the top of the photo because I don't wanna to touch that, only the bottom and sides of the stage. Finally, I'm gonna adjust the brightness of the mask so it just looks natural. And voila, here's the before and here's the after. Burning the image actually pushes your eyes from all sides on the bottom to right where I want. If you never saw the before image, which of course you never would unless you watch this video, you'd think this is how the stage looked in real life. This makes it a much stronger image. Now, by the way, Capture One does have a vignette tool and I do use that quite a bit, but unfortunately you can't move it around or brush anything out. That really limits the amount of control that you have, so I often find it better to draw my own mask, even if it takes a little longer to do. If anyone from phase one is out there watching, can we please get that functionality? Being able to select the center point of the vignette and brush it out of certain places seems like an obvious feature that's way overdue. Please, please, please. Now, where you dodge and burn can also depend on what type of photography you do. If I can control the light when I'm shooting, like in the studio, I'm also gonna make sure that my subject is lit so that their face is already the brightness that I want. Although I still might burn around the edges. 
Fashion and portrait photographers will often selectively dodge and burn areas of skin, clothes, and background to add more contrast and dimensionality. For me, in a situation like a concert or other event where you have limited control, I use dodging and burning to place the light where I want and remove it where I don't. Just be careful though, it is easy to overdo it. I don't want it to look like I've done anything to the image. A little vignette can help, but too much, not good at all. So there you have it, Joshua. I hope that answers your question. Do you all dodge and burn your images? When and why do you do it? Let me know down in the comments below. Remember, you can send in your own photo questions to askdavidbergman.com. If you like these videos, I do appreciate you hitting the like button and of course, subscribing to the Adorama YouTube channel. Click that bell icon so you're notified when new shows come out from myself and all the other hosts on Adorama TV. Thanks so much for joining me and I hope you'll come back next time right here on Ask David Bergman.